Back in the late 70s, Studio 54 was the premier spot on the planet for the decade's disco nightlife scene. The nightclub, which opened its doors in 1977, was attended frequently by stars like Jackie O, Cher, Andy Warhol, Diana Ross, and Elton John. Because of this, it took on iconic status and became a cultural sensation. After changing hands a couple times, Studio 54 was eventually converted into a Broadway venue in 1998. For disco fans, it's still a great spot to visit if you find yourself touring the Big Apple. But if you're looking for the authentic 70s Studio 54 experience, unfortunately, you're out of luck. The only thing that comes close to capturing what that age of excess and extravagance was like is looking at photos that immortalize some of its most memorable moments. Join Facts First as we take a look at several vintage pictures that reveal some of Studio 54's biggest secrets. It was once an opera house. The venue that later became Studio 54 was developed originally to be the Gallo Opera House. It was designed by famous architect Eugene de Rosa, who first publicized his plans for a 16-story office building in 1926. The opera house would sit on the building's lower three floors. Below the primary floors would also be a lounge and an opera museum. The Gallo Opera House opened November 8, 1927, with a production of La Boheme. For the next two years, numerous attempts were made to draw in an audience, but unfortunately that proved difficult. Eventually, the theater was lost to foreclosure. It later reopened under new management as The New Yorker, but once again it failed to draw sufficiently large enough crowds. For the next several years, the theater changed hands frequently. At one point, it was New York City's Federal Music Theater before becoming the New Yorker Theater in 1939, featuring an all-black adaptation of the musical Swing Mikado. In 1940, the New Yorker Theater shut down. The theater remained vacant for three years before CBS purchased it in 1943. Renaming it Studio 54, a reference to the street where it was located, CBS used the theater as a radio and television stage until the mid-70s. During those years, shows like What's My Line, The Jack Benny Show, Captain Kangaroo, and The $64,000 Question were filmed there. In 1976, CBS sold the theater after they moved a majority of their broadcast operations to the CBS Broadcast Center and Ed Sullivan Theater. The Studio 54 Glory Years When CBS sold the theater, various parties from the worlds of fashion and art began to express interest in seeing it transformed into a nightclub. In 1977, Ian Schrager and Steve Rubell began work converting it into the Studio 54 nightclub. It took six weeks to transform it into a nightclub at a cost of $400,000. Famed lighting designers Paul Morantz and Jules Fisher were called in to create the club's dance floor environment. They made movable theatrical sets and lights utilizing the existing theater fly systems and TV lighting circuits to create a flashy vibe that was unparalleled. These unique elements created an environment that was dynamic and constantly in a state of flux, while illuminating the crowd brightly. Studio 54 opened for business April 26, 1977. A month later, the club was raided by the New York State Liquor Authority for selling booze without a license. The club was closed for a night but reopened the following evening, serving soft drinks and fruit juice instead of alcohol. Eventually, however, the club secured the required permits. With that setback out of the way, Studio 54 began to explode in popularity. Suddenly, it was the premier New York City hangout for Hollywood celebs, trendy artists, flamboyant musicians, and even a few politicians looking to let loose. Notable stars who frequently patronized the establishment included Calvin Klein, Timothy Leary, David Bowie, Salvador Dali, and Mick Jagger. The nightclub's guest list was essentially a who's who of everyone making waves in the entertainment industry at the time. In 1978, the band Chic penned a song called Le Freak after being refused entry to Studio 54's New Year's Eve party. For that party, event planner Robert Isabel brought in four tons of glitter that were dumped on the dance floor. Attendees reportedly were still finding glitter in their clothes and homes months later. Hey, if you're enjoying this video so far, be sure to give it a like and subscribe to Facts First for more. And stick around for a lot more about Studio 54. Tax Evasion and Presidential Pardons in a newspaper article published in late 1978, Rubel was quoted as saying his club had made $7 million in its first year of operation. He even bragged that only the mafia had made more than that. After hearing this, the IRS decided to look into Rubel's finances a bit more closely. After that, the club was raided and Schrager and Rubel were arrested. Several months later, in June, the two club owners were indicted on charges of skimming a considerable chunk of Studio 54's receipts. 
Tax evasion is a serious crime, and they were unable to keep the doors open after being caught up in all that legal trouble. Studio 54 closed after one last farewell party on the evening of February 2, 1980. Those in attendance included Liza Minnelli, Diana Ross, Farrah Fawcett, Jack Nicholson, Richard Gere, and Sylvester Stallone, among others. Rubel and Schrager ended up pleading guilty to tax evasion and were both sentenced to three and a half years in prison, although they were paroled after a little over a year. Decades later, in 2017, President Barack Obama issued Schrager a presidential pardon. Studio 54's Second Act While in prison, Rubel and Schrager sold the building to a man named Philip Pilevsky for $1.15 million. Less than a year later, the building was sold once again to Mark Fleischman. Under new ownership, Studio 54 reopened in September of 1981. The club continued to operate until 1986, when Fleischman shut it down and sold the building. In 1989, the Ritz nightclub moved into the building under the name The New Ritz, although they eventually reverted back to simply The Ritz. The next three years, it was primarily used for new wave, punk, heavy metal, and Euro disco shows. In 1993, The Ritz shut down after it was acquired by a company called CAT Entertainment. CAT renovated the club extensively and brought back the Studio 54 name since no one had properly registered it in the past. The remodeled club opened in January of 94 as Cabaret Royale at Studio 54. But the club ceased operation in early 95 after CAT Entertainment lost their lease on the property. It soon reopened as a live concert venue but shut down again in 1996. The Roundabout Theater in 1998, the Roundabout Theater Company moved the performance of the Broadway musical Cabaret to Studio 54 after a collapsed construction hoist blocked the doors to the Henry Miller Theater on 43rd Street. Cabaret went on to run at the former Studio 54 location until 2003. Roundabout then bought the building for $22.5 million later that year. Since Cabaret's run ended, Roundabout has used the theater for Broadway productions that couldn't fit at the American Airlines Theater. In the last two decades, productions of plays like Pacific Overtures, Assassins, and A Streetcar Named Desire have been featured at the theater. Now it's time to hear from you. Were you lucky enough to have visited Studio 54 in its heyday? Let us know in the comments section below. And before you go, make sure you give this video a like and subscribe to Factsverse if you haven't already. Click the bell icon to stay updated on all our latest content.